uh, I guess welcome everyone. Um, we uh, we are uh, here again for uh, another event uh, of uh, Crossroads. Uh, so Crossroads is uh, uh, this monthly event uh, where we invite fun people uh, to talk about fun things. And those things happen to be related to intelligence, uh, its mechanisms, its mathematics, or uh, even more fun questions. Uh, so this event is uh, uh, organized by Cross Labs, uh, which is a research institute and a new kind of university um, embedded in the industry uh, in uh, Japan, uh, Tokyo and Kyoto. Um, so you can find all information on uh, crosslabs.org. Uh, I'll post some info later. Um, the cross in the crossroads and cross labs also refers to uh, interdisciplinary uh, science, but it also refers to uh, Cross Compass, which is a leading uh, AI company that is uh, funding us um, uh, in Japan. Um, and this uh, AI company uh, gives us some help also. And uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, Antoine Pasquali, Katsunobu Suzuki, um, uh, and uh, also anyone who is uh, uh, helping us in general. So thank you. Um, special thanks this month to um, uh, Stephen and Onelis, uh, thanks to whom we have new visuals today. So give us uh, uh, some some feedback if you like it, uh, what you'd like to, to be improved, etc. That would be uh, super helpful for us. Um, and today might be a, a bit of a test session, so let us know if something is working or not. Uh, oh yeah, I should mention we just created a new journal uh, for intelligent sciences. Um, you can find it at uh, imijournal.org. So I am I and the journal normally that one. Okay, um, and uh, I guess uh, without further ado, I should uh, uh, introduce today uh, speaker uh, Julian Togalius. Uh, hi, Julian. Hello, Olaf. Um, great to be here. So Julian, uh, that we have the real pleasure to, to have uh, here again. I had him uh, before at another event. Uh, in New York, but uh, he's an associate professor at the um, Department of uh, Computer Science and Engineering at the NYU, New York University, Tandon School of Engineering. And um, previously, uh, I think you were also associate professor at the Center for Computer Games uh, Research in uh, Copenhagen, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you're working on uh, AI techniques, uh, I quote, uh, for making computer games more fun and on games for making AI smarter. Uh, so uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. And um, and uh, you ask what uh, AI can do for games and what games can do for AI. Uh, a lot of research interests um, are very close, really. Uh, so so talking about um, uh, things related to intelligence, AI, and uh, how playfulness and uh, open-endedness can also help. A lot of topics that are really close between our labs. Actually, uh, uh, one of your postdocs uh, recently uh, joined us, so so we <laughs> we are tackling very similar questions. It's a real pleasure to um, to have you. So we'll have um, uh, three parts as as usual. The first part is uh, the most important. Uh, you're going to to chat uh, about uh, a topic that is uh, exciting to you. So today about AGI. So we're going to be uh, having some fun uh, with them. Um, uh, yeah, questions and answers. You can already ask your questions on Slido. I'll post the link in a second. And the third part will be a more informal uh, part where we are having a drink and a relaxed conversation. That part will be offline. Oh, wait, wait. Well. Do, do I have to wait for the drink into them? Um, oh, no. Oh, no. You can you can start drinking now, really. You deserve oh, it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess, yeah, that's uh, that's it for me. Let's, um, let's hear a bit of AGI. Uh, so I'll disagree right. for now, and you can you feel free to share your slides. Thank you so much, Olaf, um, and I'm happy to be here. So I'm Julian Togelius. I'm from New York University and Model AI. Um, and I'm talking about artificial general intelligence here. So a quick summary of who I am is that I used to want to be a philosopher, um, and I used to study philosophy and psychology, and I gave up on it. I didn't have the patience to really make progress on pure um, philosophy. I, I gradually moved towards computer science and I did my PhD in computer science thinking that it would be on evolution of robotics, um, evolving neural networks to control robots. Um, as it turns out, 
this was um, um, this. I didn't have the patience for this either because all these little robots that would break down and need oil and sort of the wheels would get hot and uh, batteries mess up and so on. Um, and I thought that this was like not what I wanted to be doing. So I discovered at some point that you could use computer games to do your experiments in. So I did a lot of work in um, evolving neural networks to drive racing cars, for example, and later on to evolve neural networks to play Super Mario Bros and things like this. Um, and somewhere along the way, I discovered that you could use evolution not only to create game players, but also to create the games. And the things I did that sort of launched my career properly was um, building and coming up with a lot of methods for procedural generation of game content, which could be used um, in games to create game levels, for example, in game variants, but could also be used to create new AI benchmarks. Um, and I've also worked a whole lot with building competitions and benchmarks out of video games of various kinds, and some of them have been quite successful and widely adopted. Um, some of them uh, are more niche. Um, but those are my obsessions, and that's what I do these days. Um, AI for games uh, and games for AI. I care sort of equally about both. But you know, somewhere behind all this are like my old philosophical interests in what is intelligence? How does it work? How does consciousness relate to intelligence? Um, what does this mean? So people come up to me and tell me, hey, Julian, you're this failed philosopher. No, Julian, you're this successful AI researcher that used to want to do um, uh, artificial intelligence um, or used to, um, used to want to do philosophy of mind. So what about this super intelligence I hear? And people start talking about, well, is it true that intelligence, artificial intelligence is going to be so good that it starts improving itself and um, takes over the world, like in Terminator or the Matrix? How are we going to control future super intelligences? Um, will they, um, uh, what will they be like? Will they treat us like flies? Um, and what morals will they have? They must be ethical because they're so smart, right? And a lot of people care very deeply about this. And I'm not only talking about like uh, entities such as Stephen Hawking or Elon Musk or Bill Gates or something, but I'm talking about like um, people that should know better um, as well. So that's great, right? That's exactly that I'm up my alley, isn't it? To me, um, a lot of these sound like non-debates. They make me think of the ancient, or like not ancient, the early modern time, late medieval, early modern argument about how many angels can, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. So the question how many angels can dance on the head of a pin is uh, a sort of a parody or um, even um, a malevol malevolent characterization of the arguments that went on in medieval Catholic scholastic philosophy the type of philosophy that dominated learned Europe in the medieval ages. Uh, and their detractors of this kind of philosophy would say that, uh, you know, people were like debating the most pointless, useless things that had no bearing on actual reality, such as how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Uh, and this is how super intelligence and AGI debates make me feel. Like we're talking about nothing. How could you possibly talk about like the morality of a potential future super intelligent machine? What is this even? What is this intelligent you're talking about? Oh, and it's going to basically build itself. Like, you know, this is anchored in what? Have you ever um, seen a so-called artificial intelligence? Uh, it feels like this is a kind of debates that people have that never write code, never seen code, never smelled code. Weirdly enough, some people that do write code actually actually have this argument as well. Um, just like as a footnote here, um, the actual debate about how many angels can dance on the, on the head of a pin isn't, the, the, this was never phrased in that particular form in medieval scholastic philosophy. There were debates about whether angels um, were spatial or non-spatial. Did they take up um, a, 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 a certain amount of space or could you have infinitely many of them in the same place? 
This wasn't really a central debate, but it was a debate with some consequence. Uh, I must also point out that there was a lot of good philosophy done by Catholic scholars in medieval Europe. They contributed logic and epistemology, and it was all very, and so there's a lot of good stuff as well. It wasn't all ridiculous. But to me, talking about a superintelligence and what do we do is a little bit like talking about what an angel would do. It doesn't even make sense. I don't believe in angels. It's not like, you know, I have an argument against the existence of angels. It's like, why are we even talking about angels? It's like a bizarre thing. Some, some, uh, some artist has drawn like half naked people with wings on. Um, so let's look at the arguments. There is this super intelligence argument, uh, which was made in its modern form in the recorded in the philosophical literature in 1965 by I.J. Good. Um, fantastic name to be called Good. In his paper, uh, Speculations Concerning the First Ultra Intelligent Machine. He called it Ultra Intelligence. It's now often called Super Intelligence. Most, more recently, Nick Bostrom, um, Swedish philosopher in Oxford, um, uh, uh, wrote a book called Super Intelligence Paths, Dangers, Strategies which surprisingly became a bestseller and was found on the bookshelf of a lot of people who should know better. It's actually a pretty well-written book, but it make, ha, makes a number of assumptions which are entirely uh, unwarranted and um, not really declared as it should be. Let's look at the argument, the I.J. Goods argument back from 1965. Let an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Since the design of machines is one of these intellectual activities, an ultra-intelligent machine could design even better machines. There would then unquestionably be an intelligence explosion, and the intelligence of man would be left far behind. Thus, the first ultra-intelligent machine is the last invention that man need ever make. And some people would um, replace need with will here in the last, um, uh, in, in the last sentence. Uh, so the argument actually has a pretty good internal logic. The argument as such is, 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 pretty, is pretty good. However, we can question a lot of the assumptions here. This is, by the way, is the um, essentially the premise for both the Terminator series and the Matrix series. So there's like a lot of whatever you whatever you think of the argument, some pretty good science fiction came out of this. So first of all, can a human design an ultra intelligent machine um, or any kind of intelligent machine? Because if we look at this, um, and you know, one of these intellectual uh, since the design of these machines is one of these intellectual activities. An ultra intelligent machine could design even better machines. Makes sense if a human can design an intelligent machine. I happen to think that a human cannot design an intelligent machine. Have you considered what it takes to design a machine? Have you considered that um, even to, um, to create something as simple as a pencil, you're probably relying on at least a dozen different steps in the manufacturing chain. Everything from like extracting the graphite and treating it and um, uh, uh, filling the timber and uh, shaping it to the correct form. And there's a lot of distribution and so on. It's extremely complex. So what is it like with an actual computer? This is some highly simplified um, um, a diagram I found online somewhere about the supply chain for laptops. Uh, and it is extremely complex. You need all these materials from pretty much literally all over the world, like all of all, all five continents. And then you need to design the different parts and you need to assemble the different parts. And this is like a super complex supply chain with lots of bottlenecks, um, and including like there's only two or three places in the world that can manufacture modern processors, for example. Um, two of them in somewhat volatile areas, TSMC in Taiwan and Samsung in Korea. Um, and they all both depend on the machines that are developed in Netherlands, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is like um, very non-trivial. A human cannot build a computer. Like 
millions of humans in a complicated network can build a computer. And that's just the hardware. Now you look at the software, TensorFlow, which um, is the most widely used um, deep learning library right now, has 2.5 million lines of code. The Linux core has 28 million lines of code contributed by approximately 14K developers. And of course, there are many, many, many different software layers in, in, between, in, in between. So obviously, a human cannot create the software for an ultra-intelligent machine either. We're talking about at least many thousands of humans. Usually, these improvements in AI capability are dependent on improvements across the whole stack. So what the, the, probably the biggest thing to happen in deep learning in the last 10 years is the widespread use of GPUs. GPUs were created for a completely different purpose for rendering graphics for games. Um, and then they got co-opted um, into, into sort of running neural networks. And this was of obviously a non-trivial thing. Um, building all the software in between was extremely non-trivial. And then, of course, they depend on advances in storage and network architecture and so on. And imagine that you created some kind of um, software that would be extremely good at building neural network architectures. Then you could run the software and it could design itself better neural network architectures. How long could it do this? Probably not very long until, until you suddenly need um, improvements in all the other parts of the chain. So you really need to improve the whole stack from like the manganese mines and sort of the um, chemical factories and the wafer shell fabrication to um, building operating systems and storage systems to uh, building the actual neural networks. So my argument is that a human cannot create artificial intelligence. A civilization can. Now, we also talk, go back to the argument here. Um, um, an ultra-intelligent machine be defined as a machine that can far surpass all the intellectual activities of any man, however clever. Uh, let's pass by that um, in I.J. Good writing 965, 965 only mentioned men. Um, obviously, there are more persons than that. But what are those activities? Is a human being general intelligent? Artificial general intelligence is very much about creating artificial general intelligence. So not like a narrow intelligence of um, this being able to create this particular task, but being able to do all the tasks. What does this mean? So I think there are two potential meanings to what general intelligence is. One is that every human can solve every task another human can. So a general intelligent, intelligent human could solve any task any other human can. The other meaning I can distinguish is that the principle, a human, some human, could perform every existing cognitive task. Because that would what it be to man, what it means to be general intelligent. That would probably also be what it means to create like a new artificial intelligence. Um, you would need to be able to perform almost every cognitive task because they're basically all implicated in creating a new artificial intelligence. I think they're both false. Um, I think human beings are not generally intelligent in either of these sentences. So obviously I can't do everything that another person can. Um, I can't dance tango. Um, I can't fly a Boeing 747 and I cannot repair an air conditioning unit. Um, I cannot cook lasagna. Well, maybe, you know, they, these all require um, various degrees of training. Uh, very pertinently, I don't know anything about um, uh, chip design. I don't know anything about mining rare earths. I don't know much about logistics network and so on. We have many thousands or tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of different jobs. Many of them require lifetime of training. Most of them require at least years of training. Um, our civilization exists because of division of labor. One way of looking at this is that while there might be a joint core of what psychologists call fluid intelligence, the crystallized intelligence is extremely different among people. Crystallized intelligence is not general at all. So the second meaning is, in principle, you thought it, well, in, in principle, a human could perform every cognitive task. This is a very popular argument among people who have taken a course in theory of computation and seen that, wow, any Turing machine can emulate any other Turing machine. 
Great. So every human could do every cognitive task. We have this kind of generality. It's not true. Human computers can perform many tasks that humans can't. So you can say that in principle, you human could um, basically follow an algorithmic recipe um, or emulate a Turing machine to do things such as prime number factorization, um, uh, ray tracing, um, a visual scene, or um, doing shortest path calculation on the street maps of the whole US, for example. But you cannot, because you do not have billions of positions in randomly, um, in randomly accessible memory. It doesn't work that way. Even if you had like an external filing system, and you try to sort of write everything down, and you run back and forth and try to execute an algorithm, you could not run the shortest path routing on all of America's roads, because you would expire before the termination, before the algorithm terminated. So there is no in principle universal computability. Humans are in, incapable of doing a lot of what you, the computers can do. And current computers are clearly not capable of doing everything humans can do. So we do not have general intelligence in either of these meanings. I think if we really, 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 really want to save this um, super intelligence argument, we need to redefine intelligence. We can redefine intelligence to whatever is needed to construct artificial intelligence. Then, then our whole civilization is the super intelligence. Um, it's the only super intelligence and the only one that's likely to be. It is a very impressive super intelligence. Um, and it seems to be improving itself, maybe exponentially. It depends on your measure um, in some ways, potentially. But this is why I do not fear the super intelligence. At least I do not fear the super intelligence as an isolated technical construct. Any technical advance within artificial intelligence um, will contribute to this. So it will, um, uh, latest AI will contribute to um, better to uh, self-improving superintelligence, but not in itself. It will contribute to the self-improving capacities of our whole civilization. Which leaves us with a question, why is there any point in as AI researchers trying to create artificial general intelligence? Because almost everything we call artificial intelligence, I mean, artificial intelligence is a, ma it's a word with many meanings. We can talk about it as a dream. We can talk about it as a set of algorithmic methods, which is, you know, when I teach AI, that's the main, mainly what I teach. I teach these like, you know, dozen or so different algorithms. And that's, that's the main content of an AI course. Or you can talk about it as a set of applications, or you have this fantastic definition, my favorite definition of any, um, yeah, well, there's this complementary definition. One is like of um, trying to make machines do what machines cannot yet do well, um, or any form of computer science that doesn't really work well yet. Um, when it works, it just becomes computer science. But trying to create AI methods that are more general and are not super narrow is a very interesting um, challenge. Why would we do this? And I think there is a bunch of applications in the industry um, in to create, um, for example, a nursing home robot that would be able to um, sort of help elderly people get dressed and cook their food and check if their if their pulse is all right and their blood blood pressure and you know do various things there. They need to be able to do a whole bunch of different capabilities, um, say soothing words and stuff. Um, so there are some applications. I think there's also an application in understanding ourselves to some extent. I mean, there is the mirror of like, we build machines to help understand ourselves. And um, this is something that we um, should be, uh, we can and should do to some extent. We understand what, what is hard in our own cognition and so on, and how can it be done? And also to improve AI methods. You sort of set yourself challenging goals to sort of create new algorithms. Um, I don't think we will ever build a machine that is exactly that has exactly the set of capabilities that a human has, because I don't think there is a good business case to do it, and it's extremely hard and complicated. But we will build many machines that surpass what humans can do in many ways, 
as we have been doing since the advent of computer science and we will keep doing. So, I mean, we've had super intelligent AI for like five decades or so, um, which is not really a, uh, nothing strange with that. And we keep coming up with uh, machines that can be narrowly more intelligent. So what's my own thing? What do I do? I, I am interested in what, how could we create a machine that is intelligent in the sense that it could play any game? So there's a lot of competitions where people have been, um, people are developing AIs to play a particular game, or Super Mario Bros, or car racing, or StarCraft, or whatever, but they can't, you know, the best StarCraft AI, not, I mean, in Big Minds Alpha Star, it cannot, not only can it only play StarCraft, you can only play StarCraft as one, on one particular map, in one particular revision of the game with one particular screen size, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It can certainly not play Super Mario Bros. because, you know, it wouldn't even know where to begin. It wouldn't be able to parse the screen. So I'm interested in the challenge um, of how can we create, you know, some kind of AI that could play any kind of game that you'd find on the App Store. Say, if you could play the top 100 games on the iOS App Store and Steam and play them until uh, um, until completion, and it's the same system that reuses components and knowledge between this, that would be very impressive. I don't think, I'm not going to say I don't think I'll be able to do this in a lifetime, um, but I think I will have to live very long to be able to do this. Um, so i um, going to live healthily. Um, so this is and, and this is one and one my particular take on like practical AGI. Um, uh, I wanted to show some recent stuff. Um, this was supposed to be a video. It is not a video. It is a screen. Oh well. Um, oh, it is a video. We are currently working with something called the Neural MMO um, in collaboration with Joseph Suarez and Philip Isola. This is my PhD student Sam Earl working on. Um, creating um, maps in this sort of um, complex multiplayer environment. Um, the maps which are conducive to creating a multitude of different behaviors. So we want to create maps that make the same policy. So we co-learning in maps and policies, where the same policy can um, display, display as wide range of behaviors possible. So we're like head on trying to address the generality challenge in this particular environment. This is ongoing work in progress. I've also been trying to address as many different challenges. We've been working for a long time with something called the um, General Video Game AI Challenge, where we try to create um, a benchmark where um, people can submit algorithms and they would play a set of games that have never seen before and uh, then get scored on their ability to play these games. This concludes this short talk. So we have, to, and I'm sorry for the technical issues earlier. So even though the short talk was shorter than expected, um, we, um, um, we, we probably end up making a talk. If you're interested in more of this, I have a public scientist, um, James Mark, just go through some of these topics. There's a big textbook over here. And I have a Twitter handle and, you know, the kind of things that people have these days. So thank you. Thank you so much, Julian. Uh, yeah, this was a very, very fun and thought-provoking talk. Uh, I'm sure people have a lot of questions. Um, I think I posted a bit earlier in the YouTube channel, um, in the YouTube chat, uh, the link for the questions. Should I, stop? Should I stop screen sharing? Uh, it's fine. You can, you can, you can leave it on. Right. We, uh, I think we don't see it anymore on the on the. Okay on the stream and uh yeah uh yeah thank you so much again so yeah well if you want to ask any question you can go on slido.com uh called uh, cross sorry not crossroads and uh, huh. yeah, I'm gonna sort of... there we go and uh and you can find where to post your questions. Um, yes. yes, just a two questions start popping up here um, on, on Slido. Good. Yeah. So yeah, how about I read the first one? Uh, someone was very quick. 
in line of wrong type of object, why not consider random search to be general? Um, can solve anything in the universality class of verifiable problems. And yeah, give me that time, right? It's cut off, but yeah, we can see the question. Yeah. <laughs> I there is a way which you can call random search, which you can talk about random search in general. It's just not a very um, uh, just not a very interesting way of talking about generality. So when I was at the Jurgen Schmidtuber's lab, we talked a lot about this. Um, and Jurgen is very interested in um, universal search and so on. Um, um, I actually I was part of a paper that we, um, um, we which I eventually dropped because I didn't have time. But we we, we had the best paper title ever. Um, practical Universal Search, um, which had the acronym PUMS, P-U-N-S. So it was a very self-referential paper, and I love PUMS. Um, so um, a, the thing is, Universal Search, you can show, you, there, there's methods like Levin Search, for example, and you can show that it is universal, it can solve any problem, and in some way, Random Search can also solve any problem. But in the real world, you always have time and computation time restrictions, and you're always dependent on some kind of reference machine. So yes, you can call it general, but it's not a general in an interesting sense. General is an overloaded word, but random search is not what I would care about, <laughs> generally. Hmm. Um, it's, um, this is why I'm saying that a human can literally not, um, uh, not solve, not do like um, a human being following um, a computation algorithm can literally not ray trace a complex 3D scene because it's we can't do it if it takes more than a lifetime. So that's my very practical way of doing it. All right. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess you said something uh, in uh, in all generality about designing uh, intelligence in general. Uh, and you said something about intelligence not being a, um, that that it can't be designed. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe you meant that it could emerge, but cannot be explicitly designed easily by by an agent. Is that no, 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 no. I'm not saying that intelligence can't be designed. I'm not say, uh, What I'm saying is that a human being um, cannot design um, can cannot create an artificial intelligence because we're dependent on such a complex chain of hardware and software and just basic um, productivity innovations. So um, the fact is that advances in artificial intelligence tend to depend on the whole stack, I mean, advances through the whole stack of how to make chips better, how to make various algorithms for different parts, like scheduling in the operating system and everything better. We've seen this very clearly in recent years in, in AI research or all through the history of AI research. Mm -hmm. So a human being can only contribute to one small part of this, you know, the knowledge and is huge. And also like the um, the complexity of just building an advanced thing, such as a computer ship or a computer. So I do think there's a lot of room for design and we do design all the time, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I see, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, the next question uh, is a very practical one. Do you have any open postdoc positions <laughs> in your lab? <laughs> I, uh, I wish. Um, I'm broke. Um, I, hate writing, I, I hate writing grants, um, but um, um, I'll post it prominently when, when I have any open positions because I always love to have great people sort of, you know, around and do working with. But yeah, <laughs> and if anyone has good tips on where to on, on who would fund this crazy research, that's great. I've had some success with Natural Science Foundation, but hey, so. <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, this brings us to the larger question, I guess. Um, what would uh, Julian offer as a working definition of intelligence? You started saying something, and, uh, and I guess this is asking for more. Hmm. I think, so I'm very conflicted about this. 
like you, I use the word intelligence all the time. And there is a sense in which you can coherently talk about intelligence of certain people and how certain people tend to be, you know, certain people, there are certain elements of human intelligence that co-vary. Um, and you can calculate things such as the intelligence quotient and it's relatively stable. Um, various measures of psychological validity and so on actually hold up. Um, which is an empirical fact, it could have been different. You could totally imagine a world where this was not the case, where like all these like, um, uh, all these like different cognitive skills didn't vary together with each other, for example. But it seems that there is something like general intelligence for a human, but that's... Oops, you were cut off a little bit. Can you repeat, can you repeat that, that bit? Yeah. So there is, there is a way in which you can talk about the general intelligence of a human. However, this is um, only for a very, or relative to the set of all possible cognitive tasks in the world, this sense of general intelligence is very, very limited. I do think that humans, like every other animal, evolved to fit a niche. Then we became extremely good at expanding that niche. We created a whole civilization that um, is made so as to, fee to make us feel intelligent. The, so the, 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 the civilization we inhabit was designed, we designed it, we humans, to make, to make us be able to use the civilization. Um, everything from doorknobs to computers to like um, traffic flows to like everything um, and our language and so on is there to sort of amplify our intelligence. Um, but in fact, the, 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 the universe of all possible cognitive tasks is so large that most of us are pretty unintelligent in that sense. So what do I work, you offer as a working definition of intelligence? I think we should not have intelligence as an unqualified word. Um, I don't, there are working definitions. Um, in, in the, there are things like uh, Shane Legg and Marcus Hutter's universal intelligence measure, which you can look up. It's cleverly um, defined in a computer science way, and it's, uh, it's pretty good. The problem is that us humans, all of us, like me and you and guy down the street and everybody, would be pretty stupid compared to in, by, by that definition. So it doesn't. So intelligence is always relative to a niche or a world or civilization, I would say. And I think the definition I offered here, intelligence is whatever it takes to create artificial intelligence, is as good as any. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's a uh, it's, it's very tricky, and I guess you could you could define uh, you have to define uh, intelligence in the context of certain environments, and uh, yeah. as you go out of this context, uh, it makes little sense. I like yeah. the, the definition, but there there are many, and I think people wrote uh, papers about listing uh, definitions of intelligence. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, Shane went through this review. Yeah. It's a, it's horrible yeah. kind of work. Uh, it's really, <laughs> it's also really fun. Uh, a lot of those come from sci-fi sci also, so it's kind of fun. Yeah, uh, right, right, right. Yeah, I, I like uh, David Krakauer's one uh, from from uh, SFI, uh, who said something along the lines of um, uh, intelligence is what um, makes uh, difficult problems easy. And uh, mm. yes, he he co-defines that with the stupidity, which is the exact opposite. You take a very easy problem and uh, make it uh, very <laughs> hard, <laughs> which is uh, right. like bureaucracy or something similar. Right. <laughs> That's um, nasty. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so we have a, speaking of sci-fi, we have a question about sci-fi book recommendations. That sounds oh. like that's good. Oh, this is we can talk about this forever, right? I mean, apart from the stuff that everybody should should, should know, like you know, you should all read um, some Ian and Banks and his culture series. Um, and um, it's 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 rare because I can read Ian and Banks both for the sort of the ideas about his he's trying to the way he talks about and try to inhabit the minds of these extremely ultra intelligent. Um, machines that that basically run this uh, that civilization and there's also the um um and it, but it's also like um the very interesting society he built the culture 
And the, the, the only believable actual utopia, which is very AI powered, um, and it's like it's sort of an anarchist utopia, and it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and you can also read them for so many different other things. They have great puns in them. So Ian and Banks Codger Series, but those are classics. So I'm, I'm going to instead pass on another set of recommendations, um, which is by, um, let me see here. I always forget the names of sci-fi authors. Um, Adrian Tchaikovsky um, wrote two books recently, Children of Time, um, which is about, um, well, I don't want to give away too much, but, um, well, I think this, you get to that pretty um, pretty quickly. But basically, it's about a spider society. Really trying to, it's really going in depth about how it would be being um, and, and how it sort of starts, um, how it develops and what how their civilization and differs from us um, or from ours. Um, and the follow-up is called Children of Ruin. There are humans in these as well. Um, and there's a lot of human dynamics. There's also a sort of, you know, the gradual transference of a mind from human body to a machine. So, and then in Children of Ruin, I won't give away too much, but there's another kind of like very non-human being that becomes sort of uplifted to become um, an intelligent, sentient species. Um, uh, so both of these are very well worth reading. They're well, um, they're well written. I hope they become a movie and I'm not sure I would watch it because it would be all like terrible, creepy spiders all over. But, but yeah, and the whole uplift idea, of course, I'm taking a sentient being that is different from us and then creating some kind of other, um, making them intelligent to sort of see what you get, comes largely from David Brin, who is another yeah. very good sci-fi author, of course, and he's still active and he's, he is active in the debate about AI and, and also like the societal effects of AI. It's a pretty, he's a physicist originally. This is the kind of person I really like as a, um, as someone who thinks, um, who writes sci-fi, but also gets into debates about um, actual science and its effect. So David Brin has written a bunch of good work. Um, Existence is one of his more recent works. I think I'll stop now because this this this, uh, <laughs> this goes on for too long. <laughs> um, but we, on a completely different on a completely different uh, angle, I recently started reading, um, or re earlier this year I started reading Octavia Butler's um, um, seventies um, series of like um, uh, now I forgot what it was called. Um, 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 well, I have the book somewhere. Octavia Butler is very much worth reading in general, but there is like a sci-fi series where essentially a set of humans come to blood. No, 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 not this. Um, I don't think it's Kindred. Um, Dawn, the Xenogenesis trilogy. Mm -hmm. um, basically a set of um, 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 beings that come to earth and must um, interbreed with us in order to um, survive. And it is deeply revolting in many ways. Very good. Mm. good. Thank you for the, the recommendations. <laughs> uh, let's see. There, there are many, many, many uh, questions pulling us in different directions. OK, so the, the next one is, uh, uh, is about reinforcement learning. So what is that mm. happening at the cutting edge of <laughs> RL and gaming? and or a life if this is one of those like um short and self-contained questions right um <laughs> so, uh, know, the answer to everything yeah you know you know the honest answer is i don't know um, i'm trying to keep up but who, who who can keep up um so many things are happening in reinforcement learning a lot of things are happening in games um lots of things are happening in a life I think that um, zooming out a little bit from on the reinforcement learning side, I think something I've been, a series of papers I've been working on um, over the past like three, four years have contributed, and to, in a small way, many other people are working on this, um, contributed to showing how extremely narrow and brittle the policies learned by deep reinforcement learning are, um, and how 
you know, you think you had an AI that could play Pac-Man, but in fact, it can only play this particular level of Pac-Man. You can only play it in this screen resolution. It can't play it if you shift the colors a bit. It can't play it if you change the dynamics of the game a little bit, and so, and so on. It's extremely narrow. So we've been working on trying to create procedural generated environments to sort of make um, these policies learn, learn, learn to be a little bit more general. And it turns out it's very hard, and they're not very good at it. It's come to the point where I think deep reinforcement learning is um, largely a failure. Um, and you know, I get, I, um, I say this, and people start throwing shoes at me. But uh, <laughs> I was going to say you're alive here. Uh. <laughs> right, 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 right. I'm safe. You don't know where I am. <laughs> I'm hiding. No, but I, I think they are like the strategies learned are so extremely brittle. Um, I think there's. An, the way out of this, in turn, to be more general, is that we need to combine learning with planning. We need to be able to look ahead a little bit into the future and simulate what would what would happen. You need world models. So take the title of a very, very great paper from two years or so ago by David Hahn, Jürgen Schmidt, which is called World Models. Um, and uh, uh, read it. It's beautifully written um, as well. And I think that we need to learn. Reinforcement learning agents need to learn models of the world, um, and then they need to use those to plan in. Even though it's not deep planning, it's some amount of planning, because otherwise we're too brittle. And we need to stop training on, well, Atari games and its ilk. Not that all, not, nothing more with games, but we need to train on games that have variation in it, um, that, gen that, 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 that you can't take the exact same sequence of actions again and again and get the same result. I think that's something that's happening at that at that front. I think. Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a very yeah. Of course, it's a very big question. Uh, yeah. Someone is is asking, uh, what about ADR? But, uh, what? How about a ADR? But but maybe maybe that's going too much in detail. Maybe, what, what, what's, what, is, what is ADR? So uh, we should ask a neural MMO. <laughs> oh, neural MMO. Uh. Oh, okay. That's um, um, uh, what's happening. No, no. Um, so I still can, didn't, can, didn't get the question. <laughs> Trying to yeah, find it here on the screen as well. I'm not absolutely sure either. Uh, so yeah, auto automatic domain randomization. Ah, uh, yes. Um, that is the lame name for procedural content generation. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 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 it's sort of there. It has been more widely recognized that we need to randomize things, um, but it is not. Um, uh, but it, there is a lot. I mean, of course, like I need to point to my, my own papers. I haven't done so, done that very much, but we wrote a paper. Sebastian Ries and I wrote a paper in um, Native Machine Intelligence earlier this year, which basically service. Um, service the field of procedural content generation for the purpose of people wanting to use it to sort of um, make their domains more variable. There's a lot of techniques to draw on um, that are not just like, you know, insert a random number generator here, essentially. Right. Yeah, the, yeah that's, uh, that maybe brings us more to, to your angle. So uh, I think Kevin asked a question. Uh, maybe we'll take that one as a as a last question for now before going into a, a, a more uh, informal uh, talk off YouTube. Um, and it's from uh, Kevin. I guess it's Kevin from my group. Uh, what do you think are promising ways AI will enter into games? Uh, so, for example, in creating smart enemies. Uh, so, PC, yeah, procedural uh, generation, AI created stories, etc. Um. Okay. Now I'm going to sort of put my beard back on. I recently shaved. I, I usually look 10 years older than me, 10 years older than this. Um, so I'm going to put my beard back on, look figuratively like here, and I'm going to be like, I'm so old. So when I first went to game companies and talking about like, wow, there's so many cool things you can do with AI in your games, they would be all like, we don't need better NPCs. We don't need NPCs that are better at like, you know, um, uh, winning over the player. Who cares? We can always cheat, um, and and the player won't notice. And and you know, this is this is uninteresting. 
And with some exceptions, that's true. That's still true. I mean, there are exceptions, but but generally, um, yes, you don't really need better NPCs in terms of like the NPCs that play a game well against you. However, you may need more interesting NPCs. Now, there are a lot of things. Procedural generation has gone since I started doing research, but not because of me, because of like a couple of standard games like Spelunky, Minecraft, and so on. Procedural generation has gone from like being a niche thing to like something that's all over in games. Um, but there are a lot of new methods that can be used, and in particular, adaptive procedural income generation, so what we call experience-driven procedural income generation, is something that I think will be huge eventually. So I'll use take this example of playing the next sort of Grand Theft Auto or Cyberpunk or Assassin's Creed game or whatever, and you can just like sit in any, be in any place and just go five hours in this direction or that direction or something. And the game would generate new stuff for you, new cities to visit with new characters, with new sort of um, uh, quests and backstories and everything. And it would be tailored to what you want. So, you know, it would be interesting and it would be like the kind of challenges that the game thinks that you probably want to meet next. Experiences that maybe the game has noticed you like this experience or maybe no, the game has noticed that you like this experience, so you probably should try this experience. And then it keeps delivering new things to you. I think that's a big thing. In terms of like more practical here and now thing, I think game testing is a big thing. At Model AI, so my startup company, we're doing a lot of work with game testing and building tools that can help. Because, the, you know, what we want to enable is that the game creator just basically says, oh, I want the game to be like this and this and this. And then you don't have to deal with all the sort of boring footwork, including debugging the game. Now, if you had methods that could automatically debug the game and then create, um, and then create um, a whole lot of like, um, uh, find all the errors, pointing out where they are, maybe characterize all of them so you can easily fix it, maybe fix it themselves. I think that's a practical, viable way in which AI can help game production right here and now, essentially. Right. And yeah. I'm, I'm, so I, I could go on for two hours, but I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, 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 should, we should let you get. Uh, <laughs> so I, I apologize. I had, um, I had uh, someone ringing at the, the bell. And of course, uh, right now, I have to check the door. But maybe I let you answer to the next question. And uh, these are <laughs> very weird times, I guess. <laughs> so, uh, the next question would be, uh, uh, skipping the <laughs> skipping the notification one. Uh, <laughs> I need more notification sounds clearly. <laughs> maybe from uh, Klaus. Um, so about intelligence, should we really be so focused on tasks? Uh, an artificial yeah. uh, artifact that can live and reproduce in the world sounds hard enough. Yeah, I I mean I agree. Living and reproducing in the world can be pretty tough. Um, uh, you're all there, right? Um, yeah, seriously, it's a very good point. Um, I think it goes back to this idea that intelligence is um, always environment relative or domain relative. Um, and um, I think that dividing it up into tasks is a convenient shorthand we have to talk about um, things the AI can get better at. Um, but I agree there's a danger in here in this. The, the danger is that you basically sort of list all the tasks and these are the ones you need to solve. Um, and then you sort of um, take that as your next goal post and you create like um, AI that can, that can work on these tasks. Um, I, I agree that, you know, the ecological perspective where artificial intelligence um, is all about like finding your environmental niche and living out that environmental niche is generally more interesting and um, gets past many of those um, many of those issues. So um, I think the perspectives are, are, are compatible. I think you can talk about tasks. I think you can use that as a, as a useful measure of things, but but at the core of it, we should always have an ecological perspective. 
I apologize again. I was uh, and I was uh, off screen, but uh, I, I trust that you gave a, a nice answer to that question. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I keep saying that it's going to be the last uh, last question, but I keep seeing very interesting ones. Uh, so uh, yeah, maybe maybe we can uh, pick the the last one among uh, among the ne next ones. Is there a question you'd like to uh, you'd like to answer? <laughs> Or maybe uh, you, you want to make uh, uh, a last uh, a last question up yourself that you'd like to answer. No, I, I like you because it's so predictable if I make it up myself. What okay. do I think of huge language models? Do they resemble intelligent or are they stochastic parrots? I don't know if you're familiar with a writer called Gwern, G-W-E-R-N. He's a very good writer. Um, and I've followed um, his... Um, his writings um, uh, for a while, um, not read too many of them, but some of them. And I used to have a high, very high respect for him until he started experimenting with GPT-3. GPT and then he figured, figured out that you can do a lot of stuff with GPT-3. Um, and then he basically got into some kind of paranoid thinking where he was like, really, you know, we just scale this. We're going to have artificial general intelligence and you should be really worried. And that's the point where he very much lost me. Um, uh, and because, you know, I think part of the wisdom is you can be very intelligent and you can still sort of um, go off the rails somehow. Um, I'm not saying he has, but I, I really don't follow that kind of um, um, his, his argument there. I think there is a danger with these Great. There are many, many issues with big language models. I love them. They're fantastic. Things like GPT-3, um, together with um, Frank Lance, um, I've talked a lot about like how to build games based on GPT-3. And it, it turns out that you can basically program this GPT-3 to be creative in the way you want by providing the right, providing it the right prompt. Um, and, and it does amazing things. Um, you can really, it, 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 it really is kind of magic. But, it's not intelligence. It doesn't live in an environment. It doesn't take actions. It doesn't um, do things it needs to survive. Um, it doesn't do any of these things. Um, it is certainly not embodied, but that might not might or might not be necessary. Um, it the, the phrase stochastic parrots is pretty good. I usually um, I usually compare it to like people like smart students who try to cheat the way through the homework by basically. Um, paraphrasing things and, and saying things that sound reasonable. Um, so not only is G GPT-3 um, doesn't like do things that make it survive in an environment, it also doesn't say things that are true a lot of the time. You can just basically um, ask it to talk about like um, who killed Albert Einstein. And of course it will talk about who killed Albert Einstein, you know. Um, and as far as we know, Albert Einstein died of natural causes. Um, so, um, and you, you can make it say basically anything. So, um, do they resemble intelligence in the, in the sense, in the sense of the word resemble, like, you know, it looks from the outside, like intelligence, like, you know, you can build a building that looks like a, like a giraffe, um, and it resembles a giraffe, but it in no way is it a giraffe. It's a, you can build a robot cat and it looks like a robot, but it isn't a cat. Yeah, yeah, and it looks like a cat, but it isn't a cat. So yeah, I think the very stochastic parrots are pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah. Which is, which I'm not saying this in any way to sort of you know put down these models. They are amazing. Um, they do fantastic things. Um, but yeah, it's something else. Yeah. The I guess it, it brings us back to to a point you brought up earlier. The um, uh, all those language models, especially GPT three. Uh, is is uh, relying so so much on on this huge amount of data, and uh, you have this emergent, more I guess less narrow intelligence with, from the within that kind of comes out. But it's some completely opposite direction to the other uh, the, the paper you mentioned from David Ha, right? Like uh, with the uh, with with, right. uh, with um, Jürgen Schmidt Huber. I guess. Uh, in that case, you have something with that with so much data has something emerging from 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 the inside, 
Or uh, in the other case, you will have something that is uh, an architecture, a very specific one that is destined to have a certain use that factors out some kind of piece of intelligence. So uh, are, are, are those, yeah, from the, those two categories, mm. which one do you think we should m go more for? Ha. So it's basically, you're basically putting up an opposition between internal and external, sort of, right? Uh, so, sort of well, more like uh, more like one that is um, uh, I guess emergent relying on on throwing data at it and maybe different environments uh, mm -hmm. and the other one would be the hard coded type uh, partially at least like with a specific architecture where uh, you you extract something like 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 world models would would model uh, mm -hmm. somehow uh, but, but yeah. I wouldn't say world models like in the Ha and Schmidtuber paper. I don't think those world models are any more hard coded than GPT-3. They're both like learning, but one is learning from um, data and the other is learning from, right? Mm -hmm. right. Well, they're both learning predictive models. Um, GPT-3 predicts the next, the next letter or the next word, technically the next token. So um, next syllable sort of. Um, whereas um, world models predict the next state of the environment, what you would see on the screen next if you took a particular action. Mm -hmm. This is, in a sense, the world models is more like what you need if you are an organism, an organism behaving in an environment. Um, so this is like, my interests lie more there, um, but that is also harder. Learning from data, you get so much free, but you're also limited to basically your intelligence becomes kind of convex. What you produce is like from inside a convex hole of everything that's that you that you've read, and it's not adaptive. It's not like it's not trying to pursue a goal. It's not trying to live, and it's not trying to be true. It's not trying. It's just like repeating things. What we're really learning from GPT three is how much of the intelligent activities we are trained for by school, for example, is really of the type displayed by GPT-3, um, of like basically rehashing things we don't really understand. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very tricky. This is part of uh, some conversations we are having right now with uh, with, with good AI, uh, in oh, general, yeah. uh, different types of uh, open-ended uh, open-ended or open-ended evolution kind of, uh, kind of research. Yeah, good AI do a lot of cool stuff. We also, we have some planned collaborations with them as well. And, and it's, uh, I think, I think there's a lot of interesting big question asking going on there. Right. Yeah, but we're, we're getting more into discussions and maybe, uh, it's time to, uh, uh, well, first, thank you again for joining us. And uh, thank everyone for joining this, uh, this, this talk. And we'll go to phase three of the event, which is uh, uh, more discussion. I invite everyone to join us on the call. This is taking a huge risk. Uh, of, uh, but you know, uh, <laughs> we live dangerously. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'll share the link uh, to this uh, Google Meet session. Uh, I, I got a question from, from, from the Slido. Do I have a refill for the class? Yes, I'm sorry, you can't have any, but uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, okay. So, um, what else to say other than thank you again? Uh, so we are staying here. Uh, I'll post the link right now, and um, uh, we'll talk about more things. Maybe I'll mention offline uh, uh, a competition because you mentioned that earlier. Uh, really, mm -hmm. that may work towards AGI uh, and maybe uh, some. Uh, other nice crossing experiments between virtual and real. Um, okay, but please, anyone join us on this link and uh, thank you again, Julian, for joining us today. Merci, merci, arigato, and etc. <laughs>